So there are a lot of working blockchain applications now, and there's a lot more coming. You read about them almost every day in business journals. Deciding whether your organization should join a blockchain system, develop your own, uh, do you want to accept cryptocurrency payments? Do you want to adopt other blockchain applications? Are all critical and pretty difficult decisions. In this one hour, we're obviously not going to cover all these topics in full detail, but we're going to give you a really good overview of how blockchain is being applied in business, show you several use cases, and then we're going to spend time on some key implementation issues you need to consider if you're thinking about a blockchain application. So this webinar is also going to go over on blockchain business consultants methodology for assessing blockchain applications. So you consider not just return on investment, but all the other intangible issues and the overall payoff of an application. Uh, this is a multi-criteria decision analysis tool that we think is ideal for assessing all the costs, risks, benefits, and impacts on competitive advantage of different blockchain applications you're likely to have. So this tool is going to help you identify the most promising blockchain applications for your particular business. Uh, you can send me in questions now. I'll try to watch the chat thing. If not, we'll take some at the end. And you can also email me if we run out of time or if for some reason you have to drop off this webinar. So as Paul mentioned, I've been in blockchain for quite a while. It's a relatively new field. Uh, but my, most of my career has been in business, doing a variety of things, working with IT, but also business strategy and development. And as I'll stress to you later on and show you on a slide, blockchain is largely, if you're implementing it, it's largely not an IT issue. It's more a business operations, business process reengineering issue. And so I've got a lot of experience doing that. In terms of blockchain experience, I spend most of my time on private permission blockchains. So most of you hear about Bitcoin all the time. Bitcoin is largely not used in business. Ethereum can be, it's the biggest really public blockchain. But most of my time is spent on private permission blockchain because that's where most of the blockchain business applications are going to go on private blockchains. And so I've been certified uh, Hyperledger development training, and I spend most of my time on a blockchain called Fabric uh, that is the leading blockchain that businesses are using today. So you're all aware that you know the big advantage of blockchain is that you've got one trusted, very secure, almost impossible to hack source of data that you can share with your business partners. Uh, that's the, probably the single most important advantage of blockchain and it applies to every single industry. So blockchain can be used for a lot more than that. It can be used to minimize errors in logistics. You can use it to track deliveries, check the sources of goods with much better accuracy, security, and speed compared to traditional IT solutions. Today, every participant in the supply chain has their own limited view of part of the logistics process and data is spread across a variety of databases controlled by different parties, many of whom don't trust each other and probably don't want to link their IT systems together. Now, if a third party gets involved in providing a system to collect and share data, you have to one, pay them for this service, and you're still going to be worried that traditional internet databases might be hacked with either false data entered or confidential information information release. So that's the big advantage of blockchain that we're seeing in, in a lot of its applications is it gives you a shared, highly trusted, much, much easier setup system than trying through EDI and APIs to link up all the business partners' IT systems. You don't. You connect them with the blockchain, as we'll see in some other slides. Uh, so in addition to supply chain, a big use, to carry is, use area is healthcare. And it's not so much because you're worried about someone stealing your medical records records, but because the penalties, if you do compromise it, are huge. The HIPAA requirements to keep health data confidential are very severe. You can lose your whole business if there's a compromise. And so blockchain technology is being rapidly applied to health records and a couple other areas we'll look at in this briefing. Really, in addition to the having one source of data, another way to put this, and this may be the more accurate, valuable way to put it, is that blockchain is ideal for integrating business processes with your business partners and if appropriate with your customers and clients. So with the blockchain, you can integrate without having to link up in IT systems directly. You connect via blockchain. And the data you have is almost impossible to hack, immutable using that term that we use in the blockchain field. And so I'm going to show you some loose use cases later on where you'll see why this integration feature of blockchain, and again, its business process redesign, is, the real, is a real key advantage of blockchain. 
I publish this article you're seeing here on Medium and LinkedIn. Uh, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you're welcome to do that, and then you'll get notice of articles uh, that we publish on blockchain periodically. Smart contracts that run on blockchains are basically the rules for a contract agreement written in such a way that it's possible for all the information needed to figure out if the terms of the contract have been met in a reliable fashion. And then once the terms of the contract are met, the blockchain actually executes the instructions on the smart contract. Now that may, might mean it's going to send out an email notifying you that your container of goods has gotten to the next step in the process, but it could also mean transferring a set amount of of currency, either cryptocurrency or fiat currency via a bank from one party to another. Uh, in the example here, an option contract is written as a smart contract. And when certain time periods have passed and financial data, which the blockchain can collect, such as stock prices, meet certain conditions, the contract is executed by the blockchain. There's no human intervention, no lawyers, no courts. The contract simply executes. So if you think Think the contract isn't fair, you know, tough luck. Once you agree to it and it's executed on the blockchain, it will execute if the conditions are met. So this gets very powerful when you think that Internet of Things devices can write data to a blockchain. Uh, they do this via oracles. I'm getting into a little too much terminology. I apologize for that. But you can collect a lot of data on the blockchain and then execute smart contracts with that data. So let me give you another quick example. The supply chain blockchain has a contract on it saying that if your container that's being tracked on the blockchain reaches the port of Los Angeles by April 15 and you meet the terms and the contract executed a set price, but if it's 10 days late, you have a 10% penalty, or if the temperature is out of range, you've got temperature gauges, Internet of Things that you can collect, then the payment changes, or you may even reject the shipment. It may not be accepted, may, no payment may occur if, for example, you violate a temperature violation or the date time stamp when you arrive at the Port of Los Angeles is too far gone and you refuse the shipment. That's the terms of the contract. So smart contracts are almost in some ways as important and some applications more important than the other blockchain advantages. And they're very useful in applications like an insurance policy. Uh, we see a lot of those applications rolling out where the claims process can take a lot of time, lots of manual operations, uh, but a lot of these are now going to be automated and implemented with smart contracts running on a blockchain. Uh, smart contracts are also being used for trade finance and letters of credit issuance, replacing a lot of paperwork and manual processes that can cause errors and delays and expenses. On this slide, we've listed uh, the 16 major advantages of blockchain that we see in business applications as of today. This is the list my firm maintains and updates. So it's a lot of advantages. And there's so many business processes today that are very fragmented with lots of business partners and middlemen with lots of stovepipe databases. That's where you see huge potential for blockchain application adding value. Traditional IT systems can, in theory, link disparate databases, but you don't have the security or the immutability and trustworthiness features that blockchain offers. Also, it's just simply much more expensive. If you're trying to link every company through EDI and APIs over the internet, the costs of doing that uh, are much higher than trying to connect everyone with a blockchain system. Now, you're not going to abandon old IT systems. If you're a manufacturer, you're definitely going to keep your ERP system, but the blockchain serves as the unifying link to share data with other business partners, and with hash codes, you secure the data so it's truly immutable and trustworthy there on the blockchain. And again, smart contracts that you use offer lots of ways to speed up business processes. You can automate notifications, emails being sent. You can reduce errors, reduce manual processes, and thus cut a lot of administrative costs. It's really hard to imagine a business process where you could not benefit by using smart contracts and blockchain. 
This is a survey that Deloitte did last year uh, on about how largely big companies are using blockchain. And supply chain is the number one application area for big businesses. It's really ideal for integrating IT systems and business partners, and that's what you're doing in a supply chain. The Internet of Things as an application area kind of surprised me because I don't think of this as, I think of IoT as a tool, sensors, not an application, but they listed it separately here, and it's the second big area of application although a lot of those Internet of Things applications are in many cases supporting a supply chain application. Digital identity and digital records, the next two areas. Uh, the best example here is the medical records applications of blockchain, and both are in use here. For example, if you've got medical records that you want matched to you, you're going to use your digital identity so you can control who gets access to your records, and you can keep your name personal. Your digital identity can be a code, not a name. And again, you've got the great security with digital records on a blockchain, which is especially vital in healthcare applications where you can't afford to have personal healthcare data get hacked and improperly released. Now note that digital currency, the very first blockchain application with Bitcoin, is not a type of business use case uh, and it's, it's not necessarily a big area of use. You'll find lots of business blockchains don't use cryptocurrency at all. Uh, so there's a misconception that Blockchain is all about cryptocurrency, not so at all. In business applications, it's largely about having shared sources of data that are reliable and trustworthy because they're maintained on a blockchain, and then the smart contract advantages that we've got. And some other applications, payments and voting, and many others uh, that have developed even since this survey came out. Now, my firm tracks blockchain applications by all types of firms, so we include a lot of small uh, firm uh, as well as middle market size companies. And one of the things we found is that blockchain is largely being used by small companies, startups. Uh, and of course, the big companies, the Fortune 1000, yes, they're all either exploring or using blockchain, but most applications are by small companies. Who's really missing from all of this is the middle market. Uh, thus far, middle market size companies, you know, 100 million size companies, they're just not doing anything in blockchain right now, most of them. Uh, the biggest companies like Walmart, as we'll see later, Airbus, uh, they feel like they can force companies, their suppliers, to use their blockchain. Middle market companies don't have that power, and then they're not like the small startups that are trying to use innovative use. Anyway, when you include all size companies, you find some different uh, data on what is a major blockchain application area. And since so many of these small startup companies are helping companies develop or assess blockchains, that's the leading business application area in terms of number of firms. Uh, as you know, there are over 1,000 ICOs, initial coin offerings, and most of these were developing a new blockchain system by a small new company. Uh, so most of these blockchain applications today are in the blockchain services and development area. Number two, we found was a big other category, there's real estate applications, marketing applications, loyalty programs. 20% were in financial services, and and a smaller amount, 15% in supply chain, and then others. And there's some overlap, obviously, in some of these categories. Some of these manufacturing applications are also supply chain applications. Uh, there are retail uh, business applications, insurance, and energy applications as well, and a lot of these are with smaller companies. Now I'm going to turn to a couple uh, use cases that we want to look at. And we'll start with this one. Uh, this is one of the most famous, well-publicized blockchain applications. It's been around for years. IBM and Maersk Shipping developed uh, about a little over two years ago a system called the Global Trade Digitalization Project. It's now called Trade Lens, and it's a proven, very successful, big blockchain business system. Um, this blockchain system keeps track of all the documents for an ocean shipping container, and it also notifies all parties of its movement and changes in status. The government approvals, like customs notifications and shipping authorization, all the information needed so a transaction and shipment can, can occur are securely locked into the blockchain so people who are authorized can see it, but only legitimate correct entries can be made, and you're connecting all the parties involved in the shipment via blockchain. Many studies have shown that 30 different organizations can be involved in an ocean shipping of a good. So trying to connect 30 companies, IT systems together, 
would be a mess, but you can connect together fairly easily on blockchain. Now, this system is running on Hyperledger Fabric, which is a private permission blockchain. And this is no surprise because IBM is a major backer of Hyperledger, and they actually developed a major part of the development of Hyperledger Fabric. And most businesses, as I said earlier, are going to want to run on private blockchains, not public blockchains like Ethereum. There are business applications that run on the public Ethereum blockchain, but it's much slower and has a lot of other disadvantages, as we'll see, compared to private permission blockchain. So this Global Ocean container tracking system provides a trusted, shared, distributed ledger that all parties can see when they're authorized to and parts are authorized to. And we see that a little more clearly here on this next slide. Hyperledger Fabric operates by channels. You have different channels, or you could think of them as sub-segments of the blockchain. Actually, they're, each one actually is a blockchain, and they're all just linked together. But with channels, you can control what different parties can see by what channel. For example, an export broker can create a container and blockchain, and they can view that data on the shipping container, and they can get Automate, automatic updates of any change to it at an early stage. But once that container is approved for export, the broker can just view the data, he can't change it. And once it gets booked for shipping, the broker is no longer authorized to get any data on that container at all. Because of the separation and control of data access, competitors to Maersk, for example, could use this blockchain, and they are using this blockchain, even though they're competitors and they don't have to worry about Maersk seeing their data because they're in separate channels. You can have separate smart contracts in different channels. So if you want to have different pricing for different parties, that's fine. You use different smart contracts. They're called chain code in hyperfabric terminology. And as a result of that, party A can't see that you've charged them price X versus price Y for someone else. So you can keep information confidential on a private permission blockchain um, like Hyperledger Fabric. As of 2019, the TradeLens Ocean Shipping Blockchain system had several of the largest ocean shipping companies in the world using their system, including Maersk competitors. Um, they had competing, and there still are some competing ocean block shipping blockchain systems, but over time, over the past year, we've seen that Maersk competitors, many of them, have decided they do trust the ability to use this blockchain system without having their data compromised. Uh, this is another blockchain use case that we developed. It was actually developed for a Starweaver client, and uh, we'd used it in some training. If you want to get a copy of this use case, you can email me and I'll give it to you because we don't have time to go through the big details on it. But basically we did, and this is another supply chain application. We did an example of a truck delivering goods to a warehouse and storing that on the blockchain and having the security of it. Because as you may know, there's a lot of times that theft and fraud occurs with the wrong shipping company or trucking company coming to a blockchain uh, and some cheating that results in counterfeit goods or stolen goods. We also, in this use case, go through the details of the Hyperledger Fabric process. And I'm going to go ahead and run through this now fairly quickly for you to give you an overview of how a private permission blockchain works. If you don't understand this in my quick overview, um, that's fine. You can email me and send you the use case. Uh, but I just want to cover it quickly so you can see some of the key differences. First of all, in this process of using um, uh, Hyperledger Fabric private blockchain, you have a certificate authority process. You can't interact with the permission blockchain unless you're pre-approved. And the certificate authority process that's sometimes handled by a membership service provider verifies that a blockchain transaction process proposal is from a certified user. So North Korean hackers aren't going to be able to get into your private permission blockchain. Their computer nodes can't submit information, nor can they process on your private blockchain system. So when the blockchain receives a correctly formatted transaction request, the membership service provider checks to see if the warehouse is a permission user in this use case, that it has valid certificate authorities, which also specify its specific powers to transact on the blockchain. If the warehouse has a valid certificate authority, the transaction is submitted to the blockchain for processing, and that's step two in this diagram. 
With the permissions and certificate authority confirmed, the warehouse's proposal finally gets into the blockchain to start processing. Uh, that's step three in this diagram. So in this diagram, the transaction request labeled an application here submits its proposed transaction to endorsing peer. That's a node on the fabric blockchain. Usually your company that is a user of a system will direct its user applications to one of the companies, companies run, company run uh, endorsing peers. And the very first thing a process node is going to do is to pretend execute or test your proposal to see if it makes sense, if it'll work on the blockchain. That's step four in this process. So if your query has you transfer funds that you don't have, or if you are invoking chain code, smart contracts in Fabric that don't execute correctly, your transaction request is immediately rejected. They reject your proposal and you get notification of that rejection. If the transaction functions correctly in this test, then the endorsing peer node will endorse the proposed transaction and provide a seal of approval. Endorsement is driven by the policy that you can vary and must set on your private blockchain. For example, you could say HUT M out of N total participant signatures to endorse a transaction. In other words, you could say, hey, unless 70% of the nodes endorse this transaction and say it works, we're not going to allow it. So during the simulation of a transaction at an endorsing node, a read-write set is prepared for the transaction. This read set contains a list of the unique keys and their committed versions that the transaction reads during simulation. So the write set contains a list of the unique keys, though there can be overlap with keys present in the read set, and their new values that the transaction writes. So in other words, this is a set of instructions on this is the changes we're going to make if this transaction proposal makes it all the way through the process. So whether the transaction is endorsed or not, an endorsing node will message a submitter, the warehouse in this case, with either a message a transaction failed, perhaps with some error messages, or with an endorsement. The client, the warehouse, inspects the replies, and if they were successful, the transaction was endorsed, and they will resubmit the proposed transaction along with the replies of the endorsing peers. This is step five in the diagram of a Hyperledger Fabric transaction process. Now the endorsed resubmitted transaction that now has this read-write set of instructions gets sent to the ordering service. There are separate nodes on the blockchain, and by having processing consensus functions divided up into separate computer nodes, Hyperledger Fabric can process much faster than if all the nodes are trying to do all the work themselves. That's what you see happening in a Bitcoin uh, transaction. The ordering service puts the transactions in an order for the block and also provides a shared communication channel to clients and peers and runs a broadcast service for messages containing transactions. In other words, the channel outputs the same messages to all connected peers and outputs them to all peers in the same logical order. That's step six in the process. Now it's time for the final validation and commitment of the transaction in the ordered block on the blockchain. Now different names get used and every node will commit the transactions, including the endorsing nodes. The chain code transactions, again, chain code is smart contracts, will be tested and again, and the balances, other checks are done one more time to make sure they work. Uh, and there may be voting requirements set as a blockchain policy, such as to execute chain code contract X4A, at least five validating nodes and 80% of operating validating nodes must approve the transaction. That's step seven. If the transaction is approved, it meets the requirements, then the validating or committing peers will then commit, or in other words, write changes to execute and save the transaction in their ledger, i.e. the new block of transacted data is now going to be added to the distributed ledger in step eight. So that's the process and kind of a quick whirlwind tour of how Hyperledger Fabric, a private permission blockchain works. And all this you know, looks very complex. This happens in less than a second. Uh, private blockchains like Fabric can do thousands of transactions per second. It's as fast as credit card processing. Got a quick question here. I realize I'm falling behind on those. What are some ways that can be used in procurement line of business uh, beyond contracts? And uh, I'm sorry, I don't really follow that question. So if you want to type or email me again with a more detailed question on that, uh, I'll try to answer that question. Let me see if you've got any others real fast before I move on. Why blockchain is not popular for large scale companies? Uh, it is popular for large companies. Um, 
especially as we'll see, give some examples later, Walmart's using it, Nestle, Carrefour in Europe, a big retail supermarket, lots of big companies are using it. Uh, it's the difficulty, we'll talk about this later, is blockchain's no good unless you get your business partners to use it. So you have to be in a position like Walmart where you can say, hey, use our blockchain if you want to supply us, otherwise, you know, get lost. Um, so you have to have some ability to get people to use it. Now, if you're helping them save money, are giving them other incentives, they may want to use your blockchain. Uh, so there's consortium blockchains developing as well, where everyone in the industry says, hey, we all benefit by using this blockchain. And so some of those approaches are being set up by companies that aren't large. Uh, but thus far, it's large companies uh, and small startups that are largely using blockchain, as I mentioned, not the middle market companies. Okay, so in this one use case, we looked at a supply of goods arriving at a warehouse and that transaction being registered on the blockchain and making sure that it was a valid truck. And again, the details of that are in the written use case I can send you. But in just this one use case example, 10 of the 16 major advantages of blockchain for business applications were involved. Right now, blockchain supply systems are doing pretty simple tracking of the digital asset, the documents attached to it, but increasingly more of them are using smart contracts, again, that's chain code and fabric, that automates lots of extra information flow and administrative work and even payments. This sample use case analysis shows that the big supply chain process improvements of blockchain and the many ways it can reduce errors and cut out human intervention can save a lot of money. In the case of TradeLens, they claim a 40% cost savings using their ocean shipping blockchain process. So if you're wondering if blockchain applications can improve a business process, you can go through this list and see if any of these 16 advantages may apply, help improve your process. If they do, you see some ways that blockchain could help, then you probably want to do further analysis and assessment to see if blockchain could be a valuable application for you to add. I uh, was asked what other than supply chain, what other promising areas for blockchain? Healthcare records is a major one. The insurance industry is using them. The automotive industry. Loyalty programs are starting to spring up in restaurants and airlines. So most industries are going to be using blockchain in some application or another. It's not a large percent now, uh, but we see them in every single industry and they're just gonna keep growing. Let's look at one more use case now. And again, just very briefly here, this is actually a company we're working with, uh, blockchain business consultants. Aircraft blockchain is being designed for general <laughs> aviation. General aviation is small planes. Commercial aviation is the big airlines, the big planes. Uh, so in general aviation, again, so these are small companies largely using it, you have a lot of problems because if an aircraft has records on it, like its maintenance records, it bought some new part, that is all paper-based today. So if you own a plane and after a couple of years you want to go to sell it, the buyer is going to wonder, have you been taking care of your plane well? Have you done your annual inspections? How do I know that this part can be replaced? Uh, were legitimate parts bought new, not something you pulled used off some other <laughs> old plane uh, out in the runway. That does happen in general aviation. So the advantage of blockchain is that with blockchain, all my maintenance records, if I buy a part from aircraft spruce, as you'll see here, aircraft spruce can attach a record to my digital record of my aircraft on the general aviation aircraft blockchain. And so I can see that, hey, this part that was replaced came from aircraft spruce, it was brand new, uh, this is what it was authorized for, this is its lifespan, a lot of information, and I know it's reliable because it's on the blockchain, there's a record of that. And other things, where was this, where was this aircraft uh, position? Was it really in Colorado in a dry location or was it down in Miami? Was it in a hangar? Was it out on the ramp being exposed to moisture and, and bad weather? All that information you can now in the future with aircraft blockchain, this is a startup, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, you can now register all that on the blockchain. So when you go to sell your plane, you should be able to get a lot higher price for it because blockchain gives you immutable, trustworthy data and records of what maintenance, what parts, what use did your aircraft have versus nowadays as a buyer, you have no faith 
of anything they tell you about a block or about an aircraft being sold to you. So that's another use case we see for blockchain and kind of another answer to the question, what other promising areas for blockchain? There's new ones like this starting up all the time. And this is what the small companies are doing by and large, not the big ones. I don't have slides on it here, but just for your information, Everledger is another really good example of a new use area, a different use area, and also a smart, small startup company disrupting the industry. Everledger has provenance for diamonds, diamond manufacturing. Where did the diamonds come from? And they've had so much success. De Beers has now added a blockchain to try to copy them and avoid using losing business to Everledger. And Everledger is expanding into other goods like fine wines and art and other areas where the blockchain's ability to really prove that, hey, this is where this part, this product, this diamond came from, and trust it uh, is finding really good acceptance and use. So how can you assess blockchain potential for your firm? How can you evaluate the likely benefits you'll get if you add a blockchain system? That's what we're going to talk about now. So the methodology our company uses is multi-criteria decision analysis. And the reason we use this is that there are so many factors or criteria you need to consider in deciding whether or not to pursue a blockchain application and to figure out which application, because there could be dozens that may fit with your firm, offer the most promising uh, results. Return on investment, but also other criteria beyond return on investment, such as impact on competitive advantages. So while it looks difficult and complex, the analysis is actually quite simple with the software and a few hours of training. And we're gonna show you in the next few slides uh, how it works and how it's done and why you need to use this kind of multi-criteria approach. So here's an example of a client that had seven different blockchain applications assessed by 20 performance areas and criteria. And we'll look at some of these in a little bit more detail here on the next few slides. What you do is just in Excel, you enter the different criteria and we do it in a hierarchy, top level measures, mid level measures, base level measures. And then we're going to rate and compare how every different application that we're considering, our options or alternatives, how they perform on these different criteria. And we'll see that in the, in the next couple of slides here. Now there's no exact right way to do this. Different people are gonna have their different views as to what are the right criteria and which are the best applications to consider, but you can help narrow them down and then select the best one using this process as we'll see. Once you enter the data and hit create the scorecard, it produces a scorecard that has the information you gave it there in an Excel spreadsheet. It's the one we showed you earlier. This is the, what it actually produces. The numbers aren't filled in yet. It's just a blank form. But now what you do is you go through your criteria and decide which is more important. You apply different weights to different things. So in this example here, let's just look at the top row. Impact on competitive advantages, we gave it a weight of two business process of two, the blockchain technology and IT capacity, we rated that lower as a one. Now the second level, mid-level measures break down. So let's go back to impact and competitive advantages. We broke that into three areas, being our impact of this blockchain system on being a low cost producer, having reliable delivery, and having brand and customer loyalty. And for this firm, and again, it's gonna vary by firm, and within the firm, your CEO may have a different view than the team that develops this. But you decided in this example here that you want to put most weight on being a low cost producer. That's more important. every person, company, our, our brand and customer loyalty, but you can adjust it however you want. With the scorecard built and the weights decided, you now assess or rate all the different applications by all these different criteria. And for example, we're gonna use different scales. We have to be consistent in our scale use. I'm using a one to 10 scale in this case. You can adjust that. You could use a five point scale, a hundred point scale. It does not matter. But in our case, 10 is always absolutely fantastic. Five is kind of a neutral score. Zero is a disastrous score. So now I go through and rate all my different applications by these areas. And you spend a lot of time doing a lot of analysis and that's the real benefit of this process is it forces you to consider all the different impacts of a blockchain application and how different application options provide more or less advantage to your firm. 
So for low cost producer, we developed a scale of anywhere from an 8% reduction in delivered cost uh, down to 4% higher delivered cost uh, using the scales here. And other general scales were of 10 if it was a really huge profit opportunity, five neutral, zero if it was really high cost and, and bad for us. Now, once you've entered all this in and the weights are there, the system now calculates the sum weighted average cost, that you see in the far right-hand column. And so the highest score, again, on this 10-point scale was an 8.3 for application one of an overseas manufacturer and shipping data uh, blockchain system that was used. The lowest score was in a healthcare records uh, system. This actually, I should explain, is not one company. This is kind of a and a teaching example where we used applications from a variety of different companies just to kind of give you an idea of some of the different applications. So this health records application had the lowest score and the problem that has is the area of partner and market acceptance. You see that big red colored two there. The problem was the data is controlled by lots of different business partners and in the assessment process they determined that they were unlikely to be able to get the doctor's offices and the pharmacies and the different parties to agree to work together. They would in other words likely not use their blockchain system and as we'll talk about a little bit later that is probably one of the biggest if not the biggest implementation problems for a blockchain system is convincing your business partners to use it. There was very low likelihood they'd use it, it rated a two, and that dragged the score down. So this is an application they would not want to pursue. And I think I talked about that enough there. Now, the other thing I want to mention is you do sensitivity analysis. Some people will disagree. Some people say, hey, this rate's a two. Other people say, no, it's not that bad. It's really a four or a five. Well, what you do is you enter the different numbers if you can't resolve the disagreement in discussions, and you see if that changes the score or not. When you've got a lot of criteria, uh, the change in score may be so small that you may disagree on an issue in a rating, but you still agree that, hey, the best thing to do is this overseas manufacturing and shipping data supply chain application. And sometimes you may change the weights to say, hey, I think you're putting too much concern on low cost producer. We ought to put more on reliable delivery. So you can change those numbers and again, see what is the top ranked application? Does it change? So as I mentioned before, blockchain work and implementations, the applications are usually, for most businesses, business process redesign. The IT part of it isn't that hard. Blockchains work. Uh, they're not that difficult. The technology has been advanced so much in the past few years that you can do the thousands of transactions per second. They can't, data can't be hacked. And the IT is really not that difficult nowadays. It's usually issues like, can I get my partners to use it? Can I change my business process? And what kind of savings am I gonna get from that? So if you've got experience doing business process redesign, you're in a really good position to do blockchain work. Sometimes we actually look at a company's value chain to help them estimate what are the savings and the advantages they're gonna get in changing a business process with blockchain. And in some assignments we've had, we've actually had to go through and do value chain analysis because they hadn't done it before to better, better estimate some of the cost savings uh, they'd achieve with a blockchain system. Uh, we also mentioned that blockchain can give you competitive advantage. For example, the, the trade lens system is cutting ocean shipping costs by a large extent. So if you're using a blockchain system and your competitors can't or aren't, that could give you a major competitive advantage. Uh, so sometimes in consulting engagement, we use Michael Porter's model that most of you are familiar with competitive advantage, and that helps us identify what competitive advantages you may get from blockchain. And sometimes if you have changes of competitive advantages, you you want to change your strategy as well. So here's an example of a client project we did, and this is another supply chain example. Again, this is really the leading area of initial adoption uh, by businesses. Integrated circuit companies have huge problems with counterfeit chips uh, that are being made in China and Korea and elsewhere, North Korea. And so this company was looking at um, the advantages using a blockchain supply chain system to control their supply and be able to prove to their client, in this case, it was the Department of Defense was a major client, that their chips really did come from this authorized plant in Taiwan, not some counterfeit chip coming from China. Uh, but there were a lot of issues to consider, not just the counterfeiting goods uh, reduction, but other issues as well. 
and the feasibility of using the system with their partners. All this had to get evaluated and the multi-criteria decision analysis process uh, was the methodology used. Now, our return on invested capital uh, is, is often a key criteria for companies. Sometimes it's the only one. And we have a couple of cautions in using return on invested capital. Of course, you want to use the standard that your client or your firm uses because people calculate in different manners. But there's a lot of non-tangible factors that have to be considered. Uh, like, you know, your brand loyalty. How is this going to increase my brand loyalty? Maybe I could put a dollar estimate on it. There's a good chance I can't. What we recommend is that if you are going to use return on investment to help you make your decision, there's so much uncertainty in a blockchain application, largely issues like can my business partners be persuaded to use it, that you probably want to input both a high and a low return on investment into that multi-criteria decision analysis, not just use a point estimate. You want to emphasize the risks, the uncertainties that are involved in a blockchain process and not hide them with a point, a single ROI in, uh, estimate, but show the range, the high and the low. Sometimes we even counsel our clients not to use the most likely because if it's really, really uncertain, we really don't know the most likely. We think Think it's probably going to be in a range from a 5% return on investment to an 80% return on investment. So we might use a high of 60, you know, a low of 10% or 5%, but we don't like using point estimates. It's, it's very misleading and a bit dangerous as well. And then we like including the subjective factors, the non-financial factors, impacts on competitive advantage that can be ignored in an ROI calculation, but very in, in many cases can really be decisive. Again, I, I said this a couple times here, but oftentimes the most important implementation it risk and issue is, can I get my business partners to use my system if I roll it out? It's not going to be any good to roll out a blockchain to help integrate business partner processes if they don't use your blockchain. So you can make advantages for them. There can be cost savings that are shared with them. You can set up a system such that they can be confident that you won't be stealing their data. That's very doable with, with blockchains like Hyperledger Fabric with the separate channels. And then you can offer training. You can make other incentives to make it easy for them to use it. In some of our engagements, we've actually developed a prototype of the blockchain and we've tested it with business partners, in some cases not even revealing who our client was, to get a better idea of, hey, do you like the system? Here are the advantages, here you can try to use it. And then we can have a better idea of, are they likely to use that system or not before you go out and put the money into actually developing and launching it. And there's other aspects of implementation feasibility that you need to consider. Usually the risks on developing the blockchain nowadays, they're very low. There's high confidence that you can do them. The bigger risks are, can we get the other parts of our business process changed? Sometimes you may have to get a government regulatory approval to do something in a different manner that's been done in the past. Uh, some partners are going to be forcing companies to use blockchain. Walmart's already done this. If you're a produce supplier to Walmart, you must provide, you must use their blockchain system. And the reason for this is food safety more than any other reason. There's some cost savings, but it starts with the food safety advantages. They want to be able to find out if there's some contaminated lettuce, as we had a romaine lettuce contamination problem in the US a little over a year ago. They want to be able to find out immediately where did this lettuce come from, what's the source, and to be able to have all the information tracked on that. Another example I'll give you quickly is that Care4, a big retail supermarket grocery store in Europe, they're using blockchain for things like chicken. So a customer in the store can scan the label and find out is there organic free range chicken they're buying really organic and free range? If so, where did it come from? Well, it came from this farm in Avion. And how do I know it's organic? Well, you can see the certificate by this nonprofit organization that you know of and trust that rates and qualifies people as being organic producers. They scan the label, they get all that information. It's called the provenance, the, the origin, the trustworthiness, the source of the good. And that can be a big advantage going forward for supermarkets and other retailers who want to be able to prove that their product really comes from where it comes, we claim it comes from and is not counterfeit and is safe to use. That's also an advantage that Everledger is exporting uh, exploiting with their blockchain system for diamond supplies. 
So as I mentioned, we maintain a list of applications for blockchain, and it's really useful when a client is considering adding blockchain, they've got one or two ideas, but there may be some other application areas that may be a good fit for them that they hadn't thought of that you want to consider and then evaluate with this multi-criteria decision analysis process. And you do need to consider regulatory and legal issues. If it's just a supply chain application, most of the time they're not a big deal, uh, but sometimes they may be, especially if you're getting into cryptocurrency issues. Uh, and government organizations are using blockchain. Uh, it's not necessarily one they've set up, although there are voting applications being rolled out. But there, for example, in the ocean shipping, they have governments in Africa and elsewhere using this system to do things like enter the customs good or the they may have a requirement that you can't export product X from this country unless a government agency has given you approval to do that. So that record can be added to the blockchain. So there are governments using blockchain. And in general, what we're seeing is the government agencies actually like blockchain because they like the ability to get access to information and be confident that it's accurate information. It used to be that people thought, well, blockchain is just too slow. That's Bitcoin background and thinking. Uh, nowadays, that's really not a problem for most business private permission blockchains. As you can see here on this slide, while Bitcoin is only seven transactions and it can take 10 minutes, often longer than 10 minutes to process a block of data, private permission capable blockchains like Hyperledger Fabric, and there's others as well, can do thousands of transactions per second. So they really are hitting credit card speeds. Credit cards can do like 20,000 transactions per second or more, but most of the time they're only doing it at a level of two or 3,000 per second. So really the transactions per second is probably not a constraint for you. Uh, blockchains today are very fast and capable, the private permissioned ones. So here's some common mistakes in blockchain applications assessments. Uh, the big one is thinking this is just an IT project. It's not. It's probably going to be changing your business process. So all aspects of that business process need to be analyzed and assessed and considered. Uh, are your business partners really going to use it? A lot of times there's really optimistic, over-optimistic benefit and cost assumptions that we will often question and they'll determine that, yeah, that probably isn't going to be as good as we'd like to have it. You have to have a diverse team. Most of the time they'll think, oh, well, the CIO should be in charge of this. Usually they probably shouldn't be in charge. If it's changing a sales process, like a customer loyalty blockchain problem, you probably want someone from sales or marketing in charge of the team and definitely part of the team helping you go through and do the assessment. There are a lot of bad untested assumptions that need to be really challenged and that multi-criteria decision process is ideal for that because people can disagree on the ratings. Then you can discuss them and find out if you agree that this one is best or you disagree and you enter the different levels and see which works first, what, um, what affects the, the decision or not. So this scorecard uh, methodology we use is in Excel. Uh, we can work through, uh, through Star Weaver to give you training on that. The software is actually pretty simple and easy to use. It just loads into Excel, gives you an add-on in Excel where you create scorecards and use them, and it's not that hard to do. And again, the big advantage is being able to use sensitivity analysis to find out, is this application really the best for us to pursue? You can change assumptions, change weights if there's disagreements, put in different ratings. Uh, disagreements and see if you all agree that yes, option three really is the best. And when you present it to the final decision maker, oftentimes the CEO will say, hey, I disagree with this weight. I think this is more important. Fine. It's in Excel. You enter the new weight. It recalculates and you see if that changes your application ratings or not. Uh, again, most of the time it's not. What we find is that if you have a lot of criteria and you change one by a little bit or change the weight of it, it usually isn't going to change the outcome. The top rated outcome is still likely to rate best. And perhaps the finest nice advantage of this is when you do present and you're presenting a scorecard to the decision maker, you emphasize all the different issues. You emphasize the uncertainties. You show the drawbacks of an application and you really impress the boss that you did your homework. You considered things well. And so they are more likely to accept and respect your recommendation for what application is worth pursuing or not pursuing. 
So that's our final slide here in terms of summarizing what we went over today. Uh, blockchain has 16 advantages we've identified for, for business applications, and they're pretty powerful. They're especially powerful in the supply chain area, anytime you're trying to integrate a business process, but there are many other areas as well when confidentiality is critical, like healthcare applications, when speed and accurate processing of information and insurance applications. Blockchain just is a really, really useful tool for lots of business processes. Uh, they're difficult to assess. This isn't something like, hey, let's switch to cloud computing. It's not a simple IT project like that. It's a business process redesign process. A lot of uncertainties involved, some risks are involved, and that's why we think a multi-criteria decision analysis process is the best way to look at it, to consider all the relevant factors, to explore differences and disagreements, and come up with a really sound recommendation of which application, if any, you want to pursue. We are Starweaver. Education you can bank on. For more information, contact us.